Well, thank you for this opportunity. It's a real privilege to uh, share a platform with Candice, Mahalo Candice, and share a few thoughts with you today. Um, just as Candice has, I'd like also to acknowledge where we are and um, not just trip, trip into something that happens so often in these spaces, which is an acknowledgement of territory, but actually acknowledge the teachings and learnings that we have the pleasure of experiencing, the honor of uh, receiving from our indigenous hosts here. So my thanks to um, members of the Musqueam First Nation, uh, whose language, Hunkaminam, uh, revitalizes itself through the teaching and learning that happens on campus and in community. There's so many things to talk about today, and I've only got a few minutes and mindful of your afternoon schedule. So I'd like to share one story about a project that's been going for 15 years that really started out as a digitization project and then became a culture and language activation and mobilization project. And projects um, like this live or die by the strength of their partnerships and the longevity of the data. And that's something that I'd really like to underscore today. Now, the New Zealand Film Archive, with which I have absolutely no connection, but I think is a terrific organization, set out to collect, protect, and connect the visual history and materials of uh, Aotearoa, of New Zealand, um, for the benefits of community members, uh, anybody, in fact, who would want to access the material. And I think those three verbs, collect and protect and connect, sum up a lot of what many of us do in our work. And I'd like to use them as a way into a brief discussion around a project that's going to take you quite far away from here. Um, there's a very strong and welcome regional focus at this workshop at the Futures Forum. And just the way that Candace has, I'd like to pivot a little and take you to a different part of the world, if only to bring you back again and talk about how other communities are using collections, um, protecting those collections, stewarding them, and then mobilizing them, connecting them online, in print, on air, and in communities as appropriate. So to that end, I'm going to talk about something called Digital Himalaya. Fifteen years ago, with colleagues in the UK, we realized that there were a lot of collections in, well, the heart of the kind of colonizing vortex, British libraries, museums, and archives, that had been acquired, often through very dubious means, from communities around the world. Their visual history, their material cultures, and many of those documents themselves were becoming endangered in the analog formats in which they were held. So we realized the technology was in a position to actually help not only digitize and maybe future-proof, but use the technology, of course, as all of you are, and as you've heard about the many projects that are happening here in and around UBC, use the technology to leverage collections back into community hands. And I think this is so often how it starts. It starts with the glimmer of hope, of a little money, some funding, the urgency of digitization. People who work in film, particularly 16 millimeter and 35 millimeter, have a phrase um, which they use to describe the, the importance of this work. They say nitrate won't wait. Nitrate, silver nitrate film is very combustible, explosive, can degrade very quickly. So you have to do this work carefully, but also in good conditions. And then the sense 15 years ago, and just to think uh, when hearing Candace's story of the long-term uh, relationship that uh, you know, Hawaiian communities have with technology, to think that 15 years ago when we started, we hadn't heard of Google. We were still referring to the web with wonder, you know, as the world wide web with rising tone. Um, so I think it's, it's often technology and funding driven, but I think we need to imagine processes now that aren't so dependent on what tools are available, because the tools will be there, we can build them. We have to think of what we actually want to do with the collections that we're working on. So this is what we were faced with. Colonial institutions like the British Library, Cambridge University Library, museums and archives, sitting on collections of 60 millimeter film, audio tape. This is the most basic metadata you can imagine. It was taken by a colonial officer in northern India um, on the border of Tibet in the state of Sikkim and he wrote in the 16 millimeter film canister the location and the date of where he was. That's all we had to go on. 
And when these 23 reels of 16mm film were discovered in the archives, they hadn't, we think, been viewed and used for over 70 years. They date from 1931. So in the process of digitizing, uh, we watched, of course, these films in a controlled environment on something like this, a Steenbeck. This is how we digitized it. Please don't try this at home. This was really a bad way to do it. Um, this is very homemade and uh, totally against any form of best practice. We filmed, we, we projected the 16 millimeter and we filmed the output. What you realize doing something like that, in fact, was that digitization is a sequential process. Um, the early phases of digitization, people often threw away the analog records that they digitized. Thankfully, I think everybody agrees that's not a good idea anymore. Um, but certainly, when you project and you film, and you digitize something low quality, as we did, in order to just get a sense of the scope of the collection, in order to return it to the communities of origin. Um, we had no idea the value of these materials, nor did we know that soon after that we would get a grant from the UK government and later the BBC to actually digitize these materials to a very high level. So digitization can be sequential and multi-layered in a way that you don't always expect. Let me just show you a bit of footage. This is from 1931 in Tibet. Um, Tibet was then an independent nation. This is prior to the Chinese occupation. And this footage, strangely and interestingly, doesn't seem to offend contemporary Chinese political sensibilities. So while you can't access the BBC, you can't use Google in China, you can download and view films from 1931. Uh, of an independent Tibet with a Tibetan army mobilized. So it's interesting also to imagine how history sometimes desensitizes certain documents as well as it resensitizes other ones in different conditions. Other footage from 1940s uh, in the middle or towards the end of the Second World War from northern India, Arunachal Pradesh, um, which is now a very contested part of northern India where the border with China is still disputed. This is an extraordinary festival that hadn't been filmed actually after that for a very, very long time. And the communities here, the Apatani communities, again, this is very dangerous. Please don't try this at home either. Um, uh, they were hugely excited because through the digitization, we came into contact with community members who were getting access to the visual records of their ancestors for the first time. Now it is through the process of the partnership, the collaboration, uh, the cooperation that you work out not only what can be returned, under what circumstances, where does it go to, who are the stakeholders, who has intellectual ownership of this material, but also the museum collections, as happens so often here in BC and beyond, are enriched in the process. Museums are holding collections that they don't actually know much about, and it's through the partnership that those collections are enriched and communities return and uh, have access to their material records. One of the things about these digital projects is you don't always know uh, who your users are, and we started tracking it through Google Analytics. I did a screenshot this morning. We've been very surprised to find that our website has um, 150 users every day coming to our pages, but most exciting is that more than half of those are in the countries from which the materials originated. Fifteen years ago, I think the, the general naive and maybe quite arrogant assumption was that the West would have the web and the rest would have DVDs and hard disks. That in order to connect with communities in remote parts of whether it be the Himalayas or other parts of the world, you would have to physically carry hard disks over to them. DVDs, CD-ROMs, etc. And now the rate of uptake of technology and access and penetration of, of wireless communications means that people are accessing materials in ways that really wasn't imagined a generation ago. And I think it behooves us as a community of engaged scholars and practitioners to think very carefully about what that access actually does. One thing that will be underscored in many of the presentations I, I've heard this morning and I'm sure will continue today is the sustainability of the platforms and technology. So how do you ensure that you don't produce something that worked beautifully for a week, a month, a year, and then falls over when a system changes, when there's an update or a new web browser? That's been something that's very important, I think, to think about. We've, we've been fortunate, having very limited resources as a project, we basically had to piggyback on open standards and open systems. That meant we couldn't be innovative technologically, but it did mean that we could hitch ourselves to platforms that were already quite robust. 
So as a result, the website, while funky looking, still works. Um, digital longevity is also important in terms of thinking where you put your materials. It's a conversation that's happening a lot here at UBC at the moment. Our universities, like um, UBC itself, a suitable home for collections that they do not have ownership of, but are maybe co-curating and supporting for community members. So institutional repositories um, like uh, DSpace, which there's an instance of here as well, a digital backbone which undergirds kind of the library system and the collections, something we've been very fortunate to be part of because all the collections can live on there. I'm going to wind up with a few thoughts about what happens next. I was really excited um, to hear Candice speak of the work of Larry Kimura, an inspiring and visionary uh, language activist and, and radio presenter. Radio has become something, once again, that has served as a platform for the mobilization of language. I think the beauty of radio is not only did it not die when TV came along, but in fact it's been revitalized itself through the web. The power of radio is partly, I think, its asynchronous nature. The fact that you can listen to podcasts, you can listen online, you can listen offline, allows you to be doing something at the same time as you're listening to radio. It's perfect, of course, as a medium for oral and local languages, ones that maybe don't have historically rich written traditions or a large number of documents. Uh, Hawaiian, is, of course, is a big, um, is, a, is a very different case because of the, the depth of the documentation of which Candice spoke of. But I've seen communities all over the world use, use radio in particular um, as a way to mobilize their digital assets but also their contemporary culture. I think the other feature of radio now in the digital domain is that it doesn't really matter where you are. Um, you can be streaming content from anywhere in the world and you don't have to be online at the same time as they're streaming. So unlike television, which has so many rights and is so in many ways provincial or nationally bound, radio doesn't have those, those boundaries, certainly in online spaces. By and large, radio is low tech and fairly low cost and there are great examples here in BC. I think of Newhawk radio and others across the states where community members are using radio platforms at pretty low cost to develop a very, very strong public, political and essentially sort of uh, s sovereign self-determination platform through, uh, through digital media. Um, I was struck also that one of the features of radio as a, as a method and a platform for mobilization is that it's non-exclusive. You can be doing something quite different at the same time, like cleaning fish, driving, uh, looking after kids, uh, with, um, with radio in the background. And I think that's been a, a feature that has been of particular interest to some of the communities I've, I've been in touch with here in the Pacific Northwest, but also in other parts of North America. And indigenous radio, indigenous language radio, is often community-based, it's community-run, and community-owned. And certainly given the corporatization of mainstream media, that's a, a rare thing. So with that, I'm going to wind up and uh, thank you all for your time.